Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. This is uh, our talk in this um, space from the junior members. First, I would like to introduce Hannah. Uh, she's going to help us with the to explain all the this space and also if Hannah can help me to introduce the doctor, Dr. Alicia Maravella. Hi everyone, yes. Um, hello from the IAU junior members. Uh, very sorry for the delay and all this. We had some technical issues. Um, so now we're um, streaming a Zoom <laughs> is our solution to it. That's our solution to it. Okay, so I think we'll just move along straight away, Camilo, get into it. Yes. So uh, it's a pleasure that uh, we stay here with the doctor, Dr. Alicia Marapelia. Uh, she's going to talk us about astronomy in the ancient Egypt, from the helical region of Sirius to the concept star clocks and beyond. So uh, I would like that uh, Dr. Dr. Alicia begins uh, her talk. So welcome. Thank you very much. I, I'm very proud and uh, honored to be together with you tonight. And we are really sorry for this technical problem. And um, together we're going to travel with uh, on the wings of uh, imagination to the ancient Egyptian uh, pharaonic astronomy. And uh, my topic will be astronomy in ancient Egypt from the Heliacan rising of Sirius to the Ramesside star clocks and beyond. Of course, this is a very vast topic, so I'm going to refer only to the most important uh, units of this, because already the lecture will have a duration of more than one hour. Let's see how the, the gods were looking at Egypt from the space because Egyptians were very sure that there were gods observing them and helping them in their lives. So what you see here is Egypt. Egypt is a very unique country from every aspect. It was written as Kemet in ancient Kemet. Egyptian. That, in means ancient the Egyptian. that means the black land. The black land <laughs> is the, yeah. first la the fertile land around the route of the River Nile. And as you can see, it looks like a big a flower of lotus with a small bud in the Fayum oasis. This is the delta and this is the river. And Egypt is what is included in this rectangle. Let's start with the notion of the sky, of the goddess Nut. This is one of the most sublime theological and metaphysical notions of the ancient Egyptians. You see here that Nut is extending her body over the earth and she is the goddess of the sky and her husband Geb is separated by her, from her by their father Shu. Shu represents the god of uh, the atmosphere of light of the ether of the air, Shu. And here you have Nut. So the sky is female for the Egyptians and the earth is male, contrary to the ancient Hellenic cosmovision. In many papyri, you are going to see the body of Nut that is pointed with stars, many stars. The Egyptians believe that the stars are born from her uterus in the night and in the morning when they set she is eating them by her mouth. And the sun also is born from her uterus in the morning and she is eating the sun at night uh, at the setting of the sun. According to the book of the celestial cow, the articulation of time starts when Shu uplifts his daughter Nut, thus separating her from her husband and brother Geb. The semantics of this fact are explicitly astronomical. Since the sky was separated from the earth and the light illumined the terrestrial atmosphere, the virtual cosmic scenery was ready so that the time could be measurable. 
the order created by the uplifting of Nut implies that the celestial bodies, which consist of the principal calendrical sources, should be visible and usable in order to calculate time, offering a double primeval glimpse to, first, the periodicity of heavenly phenomena, and second, the irreversible passing of time. As the ancient Romans were saying, tempus fugit, or hora ruit. And as we know today, this is directly related to the growing entropy of the universe. The arrow of time is moving always forward. This periodicity of the celestial phenomena and the celestial epiphanies were very important for the ancient Egyptian way of thought because they were projecting what happens on the firmament with their expected uh, life after death. Many people believe that the Egyptians was a death-centered civilization. This is absolutely wrong. On the contrary, it was a life-centered civilization. And what we see in their tombs, all these vivid skins of banquets, of enjoying life, of participating in the feasts of their gods, this only show their love, their high desire to vanquish death and repeat life after their death. So they connected the periodicities of the firmament to the, um, their expected um, resurrection after death. As the stars set and then they rise again next night, as the sun sets and he rises again next morning, the same way they believe they would rise after death and unite with their gods. Nut is one of the most sublime notions in the ancient Egyptian mind. You can see here one of the most famous astronomical roofs in the tomb of King Ramses VI, um, one of the short reigned pharaohs of the uh, 20th dynasty in the New Kingdom. It's a semi cylindrical uh, roof that represents the book of the night and the book of the day. So you have two bodies of Nut, one with stars representing night and one with the sun representing the day. You see also a lot of uh, divinities in boats. All these are stellar divinities, decans, etc. The sun is born from her uterus in the morning and she is eating the sun at night. But you see on this uh, part of uh, note, also small stars. So uh, the Egyptians were knowing the fact that we can see the stars even in the morning when uh, there is a total eclipse of the sun. We can use archaeoastronomical software in order to reconstruct the ancient skyscapes. Here you see um, the skyscape over Giza on the day of the summer solstice, 2500 BC Julian calendar. And you see the horizon, the green line, and whatever is inside here is visible, of course. Whatever is outside, it has not risen yet. The sun is going to rise. Venus has risen heliacally. It was first Ariel Kozlov who introduced a working hypothesis that we can also identify not, not only to the sky, but also to the galaxy, to the Milky Way. And this is actually a very good idea, which I elaborated further. So if we can put the figure of Nut on the galaxy, taken from the previous papyrus, you can see a very good fitting. The mouth is towards the west and the uterus towards the east. From the east, she is giving birth. From the west, she is engulfing at the setting, the celestial bodies, the sun, the stars, and the planets. This 
red line is the ecliptic. The Mernekha, the winding waterway, as the ancient Egyptians were uh, calling it, the winding canal. Akhet is the horizon. You see also constellations as we uh, represent them today that were important for the Egyptians, like the Ursa Major, Orion, and uh, Canis Major. And you see their names in hieroglyphs. Orion, or part of Orion actually, is the constellated Osiris, Sah. And Sirius is the constellated Isis, Sothis, Sobdet. This is a very important star for the ancient Egyptian formamentis. In many instances, in the cenotaph of uh, King Seti the First at Abydos, also in the rectangular zodiac of the Temple of Hathor at Dendera, you see the representation of the body of Nut with the firmamental waters on her body, the waters of chaos, and deacons and constellations. Interestingly, many African tribes, especially tribes in Botswana, they call the galaxy the Milky Way backbone of the night. So there is an archetype of the galaxy as the backbone of the night, the backbone of a divine creature. Probably this was also in the mind of the ancient Egyptians. There are many representations of Nut in, for example, transit, the canal clocks in the tomb of Ramses IV, where deacons are represented on the body of the goddess, and you see her here ready to engulf the sun. And here from the tomb of King Ramses the nine, with the sun on her body. Pet means sky in ancient Egyptian, and Nut is the name of the goddess of the sky. And there are many composite hieroglyphs representing here. This is from the cenotaph of King Seti I in Abydos. And again, King Ramses the Ninth, astronomical roof, astronomical ceiling. And here the tomb of King Tutankhamun. Tunankamon is welcomed by Nut. From the tomb of Ramses VI, again, you see the word Ki, it means the sky. And you see the hands of Nut getting out from her head, not from her shoulders. These are composite Ptolemaic hieroglyphs. So Nut, as a goddess of the West, she is welcoming uh, to Tutankhamun in the hereafter, offering him the Nini ritual, the Nini purification ritual with water. Let's go now to the rectangular zodiac of Dendera. You see a lot of constellations. <coughs> the most important are Sothis Sobdet, Sirius, as a divine cow in a boat, and near here, Sach, Orion, Osiris, and between them an Uaj papyrus scripter, and on it a Horus uh, falcon with the double ground, crown of Upper and Lower Egypt, and this symbolizes the new year and its star Canopus. You see also some of the zodiacal constellations, constellations like the Gemini, uh, S, Su, and Tefnut, and here the constellation Taurus, and here Aries, and here Deacons. Here you see a cosmetic spoon with the motive of the swimming girl, a naked swimming girl. It's a symbolism of Nut also, holding a bird. And it reminds, of course, the Milky Way and Cygnus constellation that is projected on it. 
detail from the astronomical ceiling of King Ramses VI, the God is ready to engulf the sun. Sirius and Sah. So there was always there are cases of hieroglyphic signs, especially composite signs of the Ptolemaic period, that show Tah as a kind of atlas and the female divinity uplifting the sky. The funerary texts of ancient Egypt, especially the pyramid texts, the coffin texts and the Book of the Dead are full of astronomical elements in a way of astronomical metaphors. The pyramid texts from the pyramid of King Uenish are the oldest ones. Then we go to pyramid, the pyramid of King Teti, where you can see the word for subject by Sirius written. In this representation, after Kurt Locher of Sobdet and Sach, as the Eastern Egyptians were imagining them. So we see that the three stars of the belt of Orion are actually um, a kind of crown on the head of the huge divinity Sach, Osiris constellation. And here you have the word for star, Shebao, in plural. So, what all this have to do with mummification and the mummification ritual? They are very closely connected because the mummification ritual was uh, lasting for 70 days. 70 days also is the period of disappearance of Deacons. Deacon is a star or some stars, let's call it an asterism, bright stars mainly of constellations that follow the pattern of Sirius, the Alpha Canis Majoris. Sirius disappears for about 70 days, let's say around the 10th of May, and then it reappears again it disappears with an acronical setting and it reappears again after about 70 days, let's say around the 20th of July, with a heliacal rising. And when this star appears again, it harbings, it heralds the inundation of the River Nile. That's why it was a very important star. And all deacons follow the same pattern. They disappear for about 70 days. And the perfect mummification ritual was lasting for 70 days. In the coffin texts, you have also a lot of interesting astronomical elements expressed through allegories, cosmic allegories and metaphors. And you have also the famous diagonal star clocks for which we are going to talk. In many of them, you see also the goddess Nut and the constellation Ursa Major represented as the foreleg of a bull or as an age. Mesectiu M. Pet Mechtet. That is Ursa Major in the northern sky. There is also the idea of the heavenly ladder, and this is also a representation of Nut. The Egyptians were thinking that Nut was not only the sky, the celestial expanses, and the Milky Way, but also it was the celestial ladder through which the Pharaoh and the nobles and everybody could ascend to the sky. She is represented many times 
in the inner parts of the lids of coffins and thus by closing the lid the deceased is coming in immediate contact with the goddess of the sky and in this way he is expecting to be born again you have also references to a um, celestial ladder in genesis chapter 28 the dream of jacob here is a famous icon from the holy monastery of saint catherine at Sinai Peninsula, and also you have reference of a huge tower that approaches to the sky in the Quran. In the Book of the Dead, there are so many astronomical elements, and here we see from a very well-known papyrus at the British Museum the ritual that happens before. Uh, the burial. A priest that wears an Anubis mask, a Jekyll mask, he is taking the mummy, the mourners, and there are funerary priests, special funerary priests. One of them is wearing uh, the leopard skin, the same priest, and others are offering to the deceased libations, and also they are touching his mouth with a special wand called Weret Hekau, Great of Magic. And also they are touching the mouth of the deceased with special ages that have the shape of Ursa Major. So Ursa Major for the Egyptians was represented either as a bull or a foreleg of a bull and or as a age. These ages were made of uh, meteoritic iron that was collected by the Egyptians and casted in the shape. The most ancient astronomical roof is found in the tomb of Sonmut. He was um, the prime minister of Hatshepsut and uh, a priest astronomer. And here you can see also the minimalistic representation of Ursa Major as a foreleg with a head of a bull and other celestial components like northern constellations and also here constellation of Draco or part of it as Reret, a celestial hippopotamus. In many monuments, like in the Red Chapel of Queen Hatshepsut, where she is represented as a male pharaoh, as a king, not as a queen. She is stretching the cord together with the priestess that plays the role of goddess he uh, Sheshat. Goddess Sheshat is the goddess of libraries, mathematics, the analog, the ancient Egyptian analog of God Thoth. And she is also a goddess of astronomical measurements and observations. By stretching a cord, the pharaoh with the goddess, they find the direction north-south and they can orientate the temple uh, or the monument accordingly. Mesectiu Ikhemsek, the great bear, Ursa Major, the indestructible, the one that doesn't know catastrophe. The indestructibles are the circumpolar stars that never set, according to the ancient Egyptian beliefs. And here is Goddess Sesat, on an obelisk, writing the regnal years and the jubilees of the pharaoh on a palm tree, on a palm branch that symbolizes the meaning of the year, the notion of the year. On her head, she's wearing a strange diadem, probably a kind of astronomical instrument that reminds us of Jacob's staff from Hebrew astronomy. Uh, Dr. Juan Antonio Belmonte has written on this and uh, also uh, Dr. Jose Lul. Uh, they have written a very nice book on uh, ancient Egyptian astronomy and they are explaining the function of this uh, astronomical instrument. A lot of cosmography exists in Egyptian tombs. In the tomb of Sonezm, for example, it's like a micrographic universe, a micrographic cosmos where the 
um, Sun God is using his boat in order to sail in the firmament. And also, you see the solar god with a huge solar disk as a falcon headed deity, together with his followers. Some of these followers sometimes are representing stars that are close to the sun, rising heliacally, for example, and a Bennu bird. And this Bennu bird is an Osirian symbol and it is related to planet Venus. Many representations of God Ra or Ra Horachi, like here, for example, and the deceased and his wife wearing um, white garments symbolizing their innocence and purity after death. They are adoring the sun, the solar disk, and also uh, stellar divinities. Many objects reflect cosmographic notions like the wedget, the safe and sound eye of Horus, that is a lunar symbol, or the scarab beetle symbolizing the sun in his morning aspect, the newly born sun. It was first Sir Norman Lockyer, known for his uh, spectroscopic uh, work, an astronomer of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, with his book, The Dawn of Astronomy. He has studied many Egyptian temples, their orientation, presenting interesting results, some of them wrong, but he was the first to put the notion of archaeoastronomical um, studies. Here I show you again the rectangular zodiac of Dendera, where you can see the real colors. And here is the circular zodiac of, zodiac of Dendera, which we are going to um, discuss a little bit later. In monuments like funerary stele called false doors, from this one from the New Carlsberg Glyptotech in Copenhagen, you can see the notions of uh, the full moon and of the new moon. The full moon is represented also the idea of Somdet, the full moon, on the circular zodiac of Dendera in Pistis constellation, and also the new moon here. And we're going to see how this zodiac was dated. A representation of a priestess of Hathor with uh, some stars. What is here shown is the remaining part of the word Ikhemusek, the indestructible stars, the second polar stars. And the god of the horizon, Aker or Ruti, the double lion, one is looking towards tomorrow and the other is looking towards yesterday. Towards tomorrow, you have the east on the left. Towards yesterday, you have the west on the right. Because the Egyptians were putting themselves with the north on their back, so they were looking south. So right is west and left is east. And every day, the sun is rising from the east and goes towards the west to set again. And then from west to east in the netherworld, crossing the Hades in order to rise again next morning. The idea of the Ouroboros is also very ancient, comes from the Egyptians, and you see it sometimes on the god of the horizon. The great pyramids at Giza have been very uh, precisely oriented, especially the great pyramid, and their entrances are lying on the northern side. Here is the Rosary of the Compass, and you have an excellent orientation, especially in the Great Pyramid. And here is an Immunut, an horologist, an ancient Egyptian priest astronomer. He is holding one of the two basic astronomical instruments that the ancient Egyptians 
we're using in order to observe the stars. In 2000, uh, Dr. Kate Spence, uh, Egyptologist and architect from the United Kingdom, presented an interesting theory about how the Egyptians were able to orientate the pyramids so precisely. The theory states that the Egyptians were able to observe a simultaneous transit of two stars, an upper meridian transit of a star of Ursa Major, and the lower meridian transit of a star of Ursa Minor. So when and if somebody can see this, he or she can take the direction of true north, the direction of the meridian. The problem is that the theory has a lot of erroneous points and it's impossible to see this in the night. You need to use a huge virtual gnomon of a hypotenuse of about 30 meters and a large side of 28 meters. So it's impossible to see this in the uh, darkness of the night. And especially for stars that have an altitude of more than 40 degrees. One can use modern archaeoastronomical software and find that there are more stars with simultaneous transit, and especially, as I have shown, more stars that can be used in order to solve this problem. However, the thing is that we cannot, we are not allowed to project our current ideas and our modern software to the ancient Egyptian mind and be sure that the Egyptians could do this. We have no epigraphic evidence, first of all. And second of all, the theory of K. Spence uh, shifts the chronology to 100 years uh, later. Uh, with this method, the chronology is not shifted. But because we're able to do this today, it does not mean, it does not mean that the Egyptians could also do this. Dr. Juan Antonio Belmonte and um, Mosalem Saltut, um, unforgettable friend and colleague from Egypt and a known solar, solar astronomer, have um, presented interesting results about the pyramids, their orientation, and also uh, phenomena that can be observed during the summer and the winter solstice. Here you have the Great Pyramid, here you have the Kefren Pyramid and the Great Pyramid. And here you have what remains, part of what remains from the Pyramid of Jedefra. And this pyramid has the measurement of the azimuth of, the, uh, of this pyramid, uh, of the entrance of this pyramid, has shown uh, that Kate Spence was wrong. It was made by Enrico Burg, part of the uh, French team of the Institut Français d'Archéologie Orientale in Cairo. If we go now to the Great Pyramid about the shafts, the uh, southern shafts, uh, some people have claimed that these were like virtual telescopes that were looking towards the three stars of the belt of Orion, but this is completely wrong because as it has been discussed by uh, Juan Antonio Belmont and Rolf Krauss also, uh, if the, this was the case, then the upper part of the pyramid should be uh, earlier in age than the lower part, which is impossible, of course. And these were simply air shafts so that the workers of the pyramid could breathe inside the pyramid while they were working. Let's see also some things, very interesting things about the orientation of the great temples at the area of Thebes. The great temple at Karnak, first of all. During the winter solstice, 21st of December, you can see the sun rising parallel to the main axis of the temple. Of course, it's a majestic temple, and all these columns have a cosmographic significance. They symbolize the primeval Mars, where from Cosmos was 
creating in the very first moment. And for the Egyptians, every rising of the sun was a new start in the new cosmogony. So, if you take the azimuth of the temple, you will see it is about 117 degrees. It looks southeast. And on the day of the winter solstice, if you look towards the back entrance of the temple, you will see the sun in front of your eyes. Or through the main entrance, you can look to the setting of the sun in the day of the summer solstice and see setting the sun in front of your eyes. A photo taken by Juan Antonio Belmonte, Mosano Saltur and colleagues that shows this very interesting phenomenon. And now let's go to the temple of Luxor. The southern harem, the Ipetresit, as the Egyptians were calling it. You have an azimuth of the earlier colonnade built by Amenophis III and the uh, later colonnade built by Ramses II, and they differ, differ about 10 degrees. And this is not due, as Nicolas Grimal claimed. Uh, who is a very known and well-esteemed Egyptologist, it is not due to the difference of the azimuth of rising, the heliacal rising of Sirius, because the heliacal rising of Sirius remains almost absolutely constant in this span of 100 years. It has nothing to do with Sirius. And this temple, the Luxor temple, is oriented towards the imperishable stars towards the circle of the stars that never set, never go under the arcade, under the horizon. This is the entrance of the Luxor Temple. Let's go now to the mortuary temple of Queen Hatshepsut at the western bank of Thebes. This temple is also oriented in the same way as the great temple of Karnak, the main axis of the temple is oriented towards the azimuth of approximately 116 degrees. That is, when you are there, you can see the sun rising in front of your eyes on the day of the winter solstice. In 1460 BC, there was an interesting accumulation of planets, conjunctions around the azimuth of this temple. So what you see on the 21st of December is uh, the rising of the sun in front of your eyes. Concerning now the great temple of Ramses II at Abu Simbel with gigantic dimensions, this has a clear solar orientation because two times per year, 22nd of February and 22nd of October, today, the sunlight enters the temple directly parallel to the axis of the temple. And it illumines the statues of the gods that are there. Here is an aerial view of both temples, the great and the lesser temple of Abu Sibel. This has no significant astronomical orientation, but the great temple with its azimuth of about 100.5 degrees, has a clear solar orientation. This is a photo I took together with Mosadam Saltut in 2012, 22nd of February, in situ, with the phenomenon, the start of the phenomenon that illumines the first statue belonging to Rahorakti, solar god, the second statue, the Pharaoh Ramses II deified and the statue of Amun-Ra, but on purpose, the fourth statue, that is the statue of God uh, Ptah Sokar, that is a funerary god of Memphis, is remaining purposely in darkness. So 
ancient Egyptians knew their practical astronomy quite well. Ramses II built also a mortuary temple at the western bank of Thebes, and it is famous mostly for an interesting astronomical ceiling that reminds representations on New Kingdom clepsidra water clocks. You have a lot of sundials in ancient Egypt that work with the uh, shadow that the sun casts if you use the latitude of a certain uh, site. This is the most famous clepsidra of all part of the most famous clepsidra, the Karna clepsidra, dated to the reign of King Amenophis III, let's say around 1370 BC. This is more an architecture, uh, an architect's instrument than an astronomical instrument. However, it uses the plumb line that is very common in astronomical instruments. Uh, shadow clocks and uh, sundials with a pole here, and it shows the, the shadow shows the time. This is the uh, so-called pharaonic cubit, royal pharaonic cubit, the official pharaonic cubit, that is the basic measurement unit of the ancient Egyptians corresponding to about uh, 52 centimeters. Parts from uh, Rind mathematical papyrus uh, calculating the second, the slope of the pyramid in very beautiful hieratic script. The priest astronomers' main astronomical tool was a set of two simple instruments, the Merkhet and the Bai and Emu Nut. These were used simultaneously by two observers in order to observe stars and determine their positions, transits, etc., and were called by the Hellenes Orologion and Phoenix. Orologion means clock. The former was like a plumb square and the latter was like a palm leaf with a slot at the top. Both of them were used to observe celestial bodies and determine the nightly hours by pointing to decans, like this. The Merkhet, the Merkhet and the Bayanimium Nut, the Orologion and the Phoenix. And this is a real set of the Merkhet and the Bay and the drawing. This is the so-called Tutankhamun's astronomical instrument. It's a Merkhet, of course. This part has been added in modern times in order to show how it was working, kept at the Oriental Institute Museum in uh, Chicago. And it bears inscriptions, hieroglyphic inscriptions. The Clepsidra of Karnat has very interesting representations on it. You have in the middle the northern constellations. You have the months of the year. They had 12 months and three seasons of four months each. The first season we are going to see it was the inundation, then the winter, and then the summer. Three seasons of four months. And they had a year of 360 days. That is, they had 12 months of 30 days. At the end of this, they were adding five epagomenal days. And this is continuing today in the Coptic calendar where they have a so-called small month of five days falling in September. There are also divinities, procession of divinities, and also the Pharaoh offering to gods. In the tomb of King Setnacht and Queen Tauzer in the Valley of the Kings, you have a huge virtual clepsidra with an ethyphallic form that is representing Osiris united with Ra during the nightly hours. 
and you have 12 figures symbolizing the 12 hours of the night. So the ancient Egyptian calendar had 12 months of 30 days plus five epagomenal days. And we have their Coptohellenic names. So the first season, the inundation started around 19th of July, following the Julian calendar, and ended towards 9th of November. The second season, the period, the winter, started around 9th of November and ended around 9th of March. And the third season, the summer, started around 9th of March and ended around, around now 9th of July. The heliacal rising of Sirius was very important because with its appearance, it was heralding the inundation of the river. The ancients, like for example, ancient Hellenes and the Romans were talking about the dog days of summer, the ardor scanis, because during these days, the sun is very close, is projected on the celestial sphere, very close to Sirius. So we can see this if there is a total eclipse uh, of the sun during the beginning of July, for example. And because Sirius is the star, the brightest star of the constellation Canis Major, uh, the great dog, this led the ancients to talk about the dog star heat. Sobdet, rising heliacal. And here, a representation of Sobdet and Sach on coffins with diagonal star clocks. In order to be able to see the heliacal rising of Sirius, you need to have special circumstances, that is, an arcus visionis, an angular distance between Sirius and the Sun, that is, of the order of magnitude of about 10 degrees. Of course, Sirius is the brightest star of the sky. However, the conditions in the desert uh, sometimes are difficult to leave priest astronomers to see this phenomenon. We know that Sirius is a double star uh, and the companion is a white dwarf. Uh, here is how the Egyptians are representing it from a detail of the rectangular zodiac of Dendera. And here we know today everything about the Earth, of, about our planet. Um, however, the ancient Egyptians were considering the Earth as a divinity, Geb, and Geb was the husband of Nut, son of Shu, and Tefnut. Geb embodied the Hades and was carrying the humans, the animals, the plants, the seas, etc. Its circular limits where the sky was touching the horizon, the virtual portal towards the netherworld, where Aker, the double lion god, was reigning, were touched by Nut. And, of course, Nut, it's a paradox, but she can also be considered as the Hades, the Duat, because when she is eating the sun and the stars and the planets, she is acting like engulfing goddess representing the Duat, the Hades. The separation of Geb and Nut by Shu, their father. The Earth and the Moon is actually a virtual double planet, and the Moon is in synchronous rotation with the Earth. That's why we have, as we know, the phenomenon of the phases of the Moon. For the Egyptians, the Moon was personified by different gods like Yah, Khonsu, Thoth, and it was identified to the sound Eye of Horus, symbolizing both the phases and the eclipses of the Moon.
there is a total eclipse of the moon represented on the circular zodiac of Dendera. We know, of course, that the sun is a typical dwarf star and it is rather a small star. But for the Egyptians, the sun was their main divinity, their high god, and they were considering the sun as a powerful day luminary and as the supreme celestial god dominating the cosmos and in the company of which all the deceased kings and nobles would rejoice in mortality forever. The sun was navigating on the firmament in the sacred boats of the day, Manjet and of the night, Mesectet, visiting every night the Hades, the Duat, lighting and virtually resurrecting the Osirified blessed deceased in the underworld, in the netherworld. During a total solar eclipse, you can see the solar corona. And here is how the ancient Egyptians were imagining the entrance of the solar god to the realm of the night. We know also about the planets today. For the Egyptians, the planets were brilliant stars related to principal deities like Set for Mercury, Osiris for Venus, and Horus for the three other planets known in antiquity, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Here you can see Saturn as a bull-headed divinity in the constellation Libra from the circular zodiac of Dendera. And from this, Enrico Bull has dated the zodiac to 50 BC, where Saturn is was in Libra. So, Sabgu was the deity of Mercury. For the Venus, for Venus, you have. Uh, many names about her as a planet. The Egyptians were calling Venus uh, Nether Dwai, the morning god, or Sebawati, the unique star, for Earth was Geb, and Mars was Hordeser, the red Horus, or the star that is moving in a retrograde motion on the celestial sphere. Jupiter had also several names like Hor Upestawi or Separacy, and Saturn was Hor Capet, Horus the Bull of the Sky. And of course, we know about the stars that they consist of self controlled thermonuclear reactions where gravity is equilibrized by the energy that is produced in their course through cycles of nuclear reactions. And the Egyptians were considering the stars as living gods navigating in their parks in the firmament. Because they were seeing the Nile and the Nile was easily uh, traveled by boat, by a boat or by a ship, they thought that on the firmament also, the sky divinities would use boats to navigate. Here you can see Canopus, the second brightest star after Sirius. And let me show you an interesting find from Tutankhamun's burial. This one, this dagger, made of gold and other precious or semi-precious stones. And the cutting part of the knife is made of meteoritic iron, containing not only iron, but also 
Nickel. Asach was the constellated Osiris for the Egyptians, but when it was ending at these three stars. And Sobdet was the constellated Isis for the Egyptians, Canis Major, Sirius. And for Ursa Major, Mesectiu, S, and Aids, or Kepesh, S, the four leg of a bull. There was a kind of very small mini Stonehenge in Napta Playa that is now transported into the uh, courtyard of the old museum in Aswan on the Elephantine Island. The main axis of these stones that were much more smaller than stem stones were uh, oriented towards the uh, summer solstice. Today, exoplanets are very a very interesting topic of modern astronomy. And one of them, one of them, HD 209458, contains two members, a sun, a star like our sun, of about 1.13 solar masses, and a Jupiter-like planet of about 1.35 uh, Jupiter masses, a super Jupiter, let's call it, has been named after the god Osiris. The orbit of the super Jupiter is so close to this G-type star that it loses mass, a lot of mass, during its revolution around uh, its star. So, because Osiris has been dismembered, according to the myth, uh, by his evil brother Set, so this plant was called Osiris to commemorate a very important ancient Egyptian god. Here you see details from the um, rectangular zodiac of Dendera, where the body of Nut is prominent. Here she is giving birth to the sun from her uterus, signing on the one of her symbols, the Hathoric head, and here her mouth ready to eat the sun at its setting. Here you can see the whole zodiac, the rectangular zodiac, as it has been restored today. And here the procession of 14 gods symbolizing the 14 days that lead to the full moon. That is represented by the wedged eye on a mirror that is also a symbol of goddess Hathor. And here Thoth as a lunar god adoring the full moon. Concerning now the circular zodiac of Dendera. The very central part is the North Pole with the Ursa Minor. The second circle is the circle of the northern constellations, between which, of course, you have Draco and the foreleg, Ursa Major, and also Ophiuchus. The third circle, blue one, are zodiacal constellations. The fourth circle, the gray one, are constellations of the southern hemisphere that do not belong to the zodiac, including, of course, the most important Canis Major, part of Orion, and Canopus. And the last circle are the Deacons, the belt of the Deacons, the decanal belt. Here is the copy of the circular zodiac in situ. The prototype, the original, is found in the Musée du Louvre in Paris. And some constellations, as we imagine them, and as the ancient Egyptians were depicting them on the circular zodiac. 
Libra, for example, or Ophiuchus, or Pisces, uh, Ursa Major, Gemini, etc. Northern constellations and the zodiac of Dendera is the most ancient, precise star chart remaining from antiquity. In the Temple of Horus at Edfu, there is also a very interesting zodiac, astronomical roof, as there is also one at the Temple of Gnum at Esna. Let's go now to the notion of diagonal star clocks. Diagonal star clocks are lists of decans that show a diagonality and they are represented on coffins of the first intermediate period in the Middle Kingdom. They are actually Permit me, please, the expression Excel sheets, not really, but kind of Excel sheets, that on the vertical axis, they represent the 12 hours of the night from the first, when the sun sets, to the 12th, after the end of which the sun rises. The ancient Egyptian day had 24 hours. 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night, no matter the season. This means that the days of the hours of day in the summer were longer than the hours of day in winter and vice versa. On the horizontal axis you have the 36 decans or 36 weeks of 10 days each. And there are four columns more. Three of them are a sum of all known decans, and one of them represents the triangular decans that were used to calculate the time during the five epagomenal days that were added at the end of the year. We know that every day a star, a certain star, rises four minutes earlier than the previous day, than the previous night, actually. So, for in order to understand why there is this diagonal shifting, we can say that it's exactly because there is this four minutes discrepancy. So, after 10 days, a star will rise 40 minutes earlier, after 30 days, that is one month, it will rise 120 minutes earlier, that is two hours earlier. So the decans are functional for about one week. And the decans, the most important thing to say is that the decans are used as a means of calculating the time during the night by observing their rising or setting. At the middle of the coffin, at the middle, after the sixth hour and before the seventh hour of the night, there is a huge offering formula, which has, of course, certain symbolism, both theological and astronomical. Let's go now to the from the coffin of Edi. Let's go to the coffin of Hecata. Uh, that is uh, kept in the modern museum of Aswan. We can see this diagonality if we take examples of three different decans. The Kedeti, the two nets, probably corresponding to Corona Australis. The Henui, the two fishes, probably Alpha Sagittarii and Vita Sagittarii. And the Haribvia, corresponding to part of Scorpius and part of Sagittarius. Another coffin. And in the middle you have also a representation of Nut 
the great bear, Sach, and Soblet. Again, to the tomb in the tomb of Ramses the sixth, to see another version of the book of day and night. In an older paper, I have tried to identify the so-called Akhak stars, the very bright stars. So, based on a coffin text, I have used an astronomical software. Red shift that is much more accurate than Stellarium for the 21st of July 1900 BC for the area of Ashut in order to reconstruct the ancient Egyptian skyscape. You see, as represented on the coffins, the Great Bear is not so far from Nut if we consider Nut as the Milky Way. And here you have a subject, Sirius, rising. And E, Ha, Sa, Seba, and Sobdet, the one that comes after the uh, star of Sobdet, that is Procyon, Alpha Canis Minoris, and probably Alneber Nihal are the Akhak stars referred to. The ancient Egyptian cosmography and geography was very interesting. They were looking towards the south, so the north was on their back, and to their right, west, and to their left, east. And the same geography they were considering in the, in the nether world, on the sky. You have areas belonging to Osiris, to Heliopolis, you know, to Sokar. And this is the land of Amentet, the western land, the land of the dead and the land of the living. This is on the earth and this is on the sky. Let's go now to the Ramesside star clocks. That is an evolution of the diagonal star clocks. Much more practical. Because here, what these figures that represent priests, astronomers, What they are, these figures are doing is to observe the culmination of certain stars. And here you have the 12 hours of the night, from the tepi, the first one, to the 12th one, the last hour of the night. And they correspond to certain decans or stars. This, for example, corresponds to Seba and Sar that is most probably Capella, Alpha Aurigae. And by observing where the stars are found, compared to the parts of the body of the priest, shoulders, for example, or hands or head, they can determine the specific hour of the night. So what the Ramesside star clocks were doing were to observe the culmination of certain stars and from this, uh, determine the hour, the nightly hour. And on these representations, the meridian is passing from the nose. There is a wrong here. This is wrong here. This should pass from the nose, from the nose and the pair of the seated figure of the priest astronomer. If we go to the tomb of Shonmut, um, with the most ancient astronomical roof, we can see many constellations and decans and planets also, like Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, Venus, and the Bennu belt, the ship, which is the Villa, part of Scorpius, and the red on the pro is Antares. You have on papyri many interesting representations with cosmographic allegorical meaning. You have the boundaries of the universe as are defined by the primeval chaotic waters. And inside is the cosmos, the netted one of the Egyptians. And here you have Mehet, and here you have Resit. 
north and south. So if here is north and here is south, then the sun rises from the east and sets to the west. And here are some of the hours of the day and of the night. There were two distinct, however, closely interrelated components of the ancient Egyptian religion. A solar component related to Ra, life, resurrection, the notion of dynamic eternity, Neheh, light, day and tomorrow. And the stellar component related to Osiris, death, hope for resurrection, static eternity, Zet, darkness, night and yesterday. Both of them attest the astronomical and cosmic doctrine character of the Egyptian form of Mendes. Dr. Juan Antonio Belmonte, Mosalam Saltut and colleagues have published the orientation of more than 300 uh, temples and monuments of Egypt, and they found uh, seven ways of orientation. The Eastern Equinoxial Group is the first one and the most uh, common, like the Sphinx, for example, solar temples of Abu Ghurab, Giza pyramids. The Solstitial Group is the second most common, Karnat Temple, Hatshepsut Temple, as we have seen. The Seasonal Sun Group, like the Temple of Akhenaten in Akhetaten, and Abu Sibel Temple, as we have seen. The Sothis Group, like the Hathor Temple at Dendera, the Canopus Group, the Isis Temple at Phile, the Meridian Northern Group, like the Temple of Horus at Edfu, Giza Pyramids, Luxor Temple, and the Intercardinal Group, like the Temple of Abydos, Temples of Thebes West, etc. And the relative normalized frequency of the number of monuments oriented this or that way as a function of the declination is represented here. You have uh, two maxima. One is uh, very characteristic for a sample of 330 temples. And as we know, the declination is related to the azimuth with a simple uh, relation that can be easily proven if we use spherical astronomy and trigonometry. The azimuth is related directly to the declination of a celestial body and to the local geographic latitude of the place. Again in the tomb of King Seti I to see the astronomical roof. And the northern constellations are represented here and in other tombs in different forms and in the zodiac of Dendera. Here again you have the tomb of King Seti I with Isis, Sirius, and Sach, Orion, and many deacons and other constellations, like the so-called ovoid lemon peep, as Kurt Locher has named it. And here are the northern constellations as they are represented in the tomb of King Seti I. The bull is the great bear, of course. Again, in the tomb of King Ramses VI, to see part of the astronomical roof with the book of the day and the book of the night, and other also interesting books of the netherworld, and details. The hourly stars or our divinities, they were represented either as female or male divinities, as they are shown here and they are like followers of the solar god Ra. One last pharaonic monument dated from the 30th dynasty, the, during the reign of King uh, the Pharaoh Nectanebo, um, is the Neos of the Decades, that was completed after the underground, uh, excuse me, after the uh, underwater excavations of Frank Godio and his sister, Anne Sophie von Bonhart, who wrote also a very interesting book about the ancient Egyptian calendar, has published the uh, extended Nails of the Decades, on which there are many references to 
uh, many references to uh, deacons considered in astrological aspects as divinities who can uh, control uh, or affect or inflict the life of humans. Before finishing, I would like to dedicate this lecture to uh, the late and untimely uh, departed Professor Dr. John Hughes Radagis. He was my professor in the Department of Physics in the University of Thessaloniki and also a part of the seven uh, members committee for my first PhD thesis. Um, he was one of uh, probably few modern Greek astronomers who uh, has realized the importance of archaeoastronomy and he has made a lot of interesting studies concerning the mechanism of Antikythera, the astrolabe of Antikythera, that was a quantitative ancient computer. Uh, let me invite you to uh, publish, to submit articles for our journal, Journal of the Hellenic Institute of Egyptology, a peer-reviewed published by the uh, University of Fine Sams, Hellenic Institute of Egyptology, and the Archaeological Society of Alexandria, especially articles related to ancient Egyptian and Greek archaeoastronomy. Thank you very much for your patience, and um, I was glad to be able to give this lecture for the junior members uh, of the International Astronomical Union. Thank you very much. in the end. Um, Hi, Hannah. So Hi, Alicia. We can back here. Alicia, you can stay in, no, the, it, in front of it, the... It was, it was okay. It was okay. Yeah. You could hear yeah. and see everything. Yeah. Yes. It, you can put yeah, in that was front a good of idea. Your... <laughs> yeah. You, you can put in front of your desktop the screen. I think. I'm sorry? If you can put it in front of your desktop, uh, because now ah, yes, yes, I, yes, I have, I have to, I have to, yes, yes, back. I have to the, yeah, I have to use the, the laptop now. Yes, yes, I'm yeah, sorry. We I'm came sorry. back. Uh, yes, to yes. So we have up. some questions. We have some questions yeah. now in the, in the stream. If you'd like to answer them, um, mm -hmm. so there's a, a question from um, Hatis. Um, is the ancient Egyptian calendar the basis of the Gregorian calendar? The ancient Egyptian calendar is the basis of the of the Julian calendar, where from the Gregorian comes, because they use 360 days plus five, that is 365 uh, in total. What I have not the time to mention was that uh, in the ancient Egyptian calendar, uh, uh, because the tropical year is 365.24 days and the civil year is 365 days precisely, every four years we lose one day. And today we compensate for this with the bisextile years. But the ancient Egyptians were not doing this, although the priest astronomers were knowing this. So we had a discrepancy of seasons because every four years if you lose one day, in 40 years, you will lose 10 days. In 400 years, you will lose 100 days. So you need a, a so-called Sothic period or Sothic cycle that is about 1,460 years, approximately, as it can be calculated through spherical astronomy in order to close the circle so that Sirius will rise heliacally on the first day of the first month of the first season, that is the season of the inundation. That is around 19 July, approximately, following the Julian calendar um, in about 2,500 BC. Thank you. Right. Um, more questions. Um, how important would astronomy be to ordinary Egyptians? Is it just the priests that think about the importance of astronomy or is it also like everyday Egyptians? Well, um, the problem is that in ancient Egypt, during all periods, except in the Ptolemaic period, 
the percentage of the literate people was 1%. Only 1%. This was an elite. The elite of the king, the nobles, the priests, the scribes, only 1%. And you can imagine during the Ptolemaic period, there was a boom, a cultural boom. This 1% went up to 10%. So the answer is that in most periods of the Egyptian history, only the priests and the educated Egyptians could have an at least a direct uh, thinking about this. There was also an, another uh, strange phenomenon that the state religion was performed by the priests, by the king, who were only allowed to enter the temples. It was performed for the sake of the simple people, of the lay people, but not with them inside the temples. They were not allowed to enter the temples. There was a popular religion parallel to the state religion that could be exercised by everybody. And they could go, the people, to the temple, to the entrance of the temple, to ask advice from the priesthood. But not, they were not allowed to, to enter the temple. So you see there was a hierarchy, like a pyramid, on the top of which there was the pharaoh. And then the royal family, the high priests, the high officials, the prime minister, the nobles, and more extended layers of population. So I'm afraid that, first of all, most of the 95%, for example, of our finds, the archaeological finds, belong to the noble and royal castes and 5% or less to ordinary people. Okay, so just the privileged ones. As but but this does not mean, this does not mean that, that the, this does not mean that it was like a dictatorship, dictatorship. No, on the contrary, because for example, if you compare the position of women in ancient Egypt, it was much more privileged than the position of women in ancient Athens. In ancient Athens, there is a de democracy, but this democracy is like a, you know, not real democracy. It's only for men, not for women, not for other Greek people, only for Athenian males. So you see, in Egypt, in ancient Egypt, the status of women was much higher. Okay. Do you have a question, Hannah? From the chat? Yeah, more questions. Um, uh, how old is the circular zodiac? I wonder whether we can see the effect of procession. Ah, the circular zodiac of Dendera uh, was dated to 50 BC. Not all uh, Egyptologists agree to this, but I personally I think that uh, Enrico Burg's uh, dating was a correct one. 50 BC. It is. Uh, it was made in the during the reign of the father of Queen Cleopatra, the known Cleopatra the seventh. That was King Ptolemy the twelfth, the so-called Neos Dionysos. Okay. Um, could the ancient Egyptians have taken or given the zodiac from the Sumerians? Is the interact is there interaction between the two civilizations? The, the Sumerians. Yes. yes. Um, uh, the... I'm not an Assyriologist or a Sumeriologist. What I can say is that uh, most probably, from linguistic from a linguistic point of view. The Egyptian hieroglyphs and the Egyptian language, the Egyptian proto-language comes from the Sumerian through stimulus diffusion, as it is said in uh, linguistics. But uh, for sure, the zodiacal constellations come from Babylon and then from Greece. Uh, the Egyptians were like, let's say, not, not so, not so um, strict like Babylonians and Greeks in matters of science. However, they could uh, describe celestial phenomena through cosmic allegories or cosmic metaphors that are found inside their religious texts, like the pyramids texts or the coffin texts that I have shown. Okay. 
I think there are no more questions. There is a, there I have is a word. Okay. <laughs> a word, a word called, called, sorry, called Mulapin about uh, Sumerian and Assyrian astronomy, uh, but I'm not specialist in this. Okay, okay. I just have a question. I was wondering um, if if the Egyptians particularly had an interest in astronomy more than other ancient civilizations, and if that was because they could see more of the stars compared to other civilizations because they were in, in a desert? Or... Uh, could you please repeat, the, the Egyptians had more what? Um, more of a, uh, an interest uh, in astronomy. Interest. Yes. Yes. Than other ancient uh, civilizations. The, 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 the Egyptian universe was, was a, a magic universe and it was also a cosmic universe. I mean, what they were seeing on Earth, super terram, as we would say in Latin, the same they thought it was in Kelo, on the sky. Uh, so we would say she could interrogate in Kelo to, to reverse the, the prayer, um, not the opposite. They were intriguing. They were intrigued by the by the phenomena they were seeing. For example, the alternation of night and day, and probably they were they were intrigued about this phenomena, especially about the periodicities of the firmaments, more than any other nation around them. That's why they connected everything with the sky, the um, setting and the rising of stars and the sun, that was symbolizing also human life. For example, deacons with their prototype Sirius, they disappear for 70 days. Okay, 70 days is the duration of the perfect mummification. The 70th day, the corpse is ready, mummified, and this mummified corpse is called a sah, that means an ennobled body, ennobled body, the body of incorruptibility that is going to be put in the tomb, placed in the tomb, and then it will join the celestial periodicities. It will contact Nut, nursed by Nut, as there is a pyramid text saying that the Nut talks to the Pharaoh and says, I will bear you forever. I will never give birth to you. So it is like a continuous hope for rebirth inside the uterus of the goddess, inside the duat. Because not is also the duat. It's strange. It's a little bit confusing. But it is an allegory that shows how the Egyptians were thinking. Do you think the reason that they were thinking so much about this is because of the location of Egypt? Um, so being in a desert. Yeah, yes, this is partly, partly, partly true and correct because of the uniqueness of Egypt, because Egypt is desert and a river. The life is close to the river. That's why they called Egypt Kemet, that is black land. And from Kemet comes chemistry, alchemy. In Coptic, it's chemi. So the black land, the fertile land, and the desert. This is a very, very contrasted opposition. And they think that Osiris, that is the Nile, is always fighting with said that is the desert. What else? You said something else also, if it was the reason that? If that's the, the reason why astronomy played such an important role was because of the location. Yes, yes, yes. This is one of the reasons. The, the other reason, the other reason is that they had two great phobias. The first of all was the um, how to put it, um, dislocation or uh, um, they, they were afraid of two things, basically. The first one was the uh, perturbation of Mad. Mad was the goddess of truth and justice, the goddess representing the harmony of the universe, what is true, what is good, the opposite of the mud was called Isefet, that is evil or sin, as we would call it today. And if the world goes upside down, 
this is the first phobia of the Egyptians. Mat is represented by the cosmic harmony of the universe, by the periodicities of the universe. And the second phobia is the decomposition of the human body. That's why they make a new body that is called a mummy, an ennobled body. All these are reasons that uh, affect the Egyptians and they make them to develop astronomy somehow. And the Egyptians were practical, not like the Babylonians and the Greeks. You have the, the most composite uh, uh, mathematical problem. Probably next year, I would like to give you a lecture about mathematics in ancient Egypt. Is the calculation of a volume of a granary of different shapes. A, a granary that has the so-called in geometry frustum, that is a truncated, a truncated pyramid. This is the most composite problem. They use this for practical reasons, not to make science per se. The most developed astronomical papyri are the Carlsberg papyri, but these are papyri during the Helleno-Roman, the Ptolemaic actually period and later, where the percentage of literacy was 10%. Okay, I have a question related with um, with the galaxy. I mean, you, you show the connection with the stars, no well known stars, but what about the Milky Way? The, 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 did you find the, it? The, uh, the Milky Way, the Milky Way, they were if you seen in the night, you know, there are stars at the uh, um. At the plane at the galactic plane and you see also dark areas that is uh, gas and uh, interstellar dust in an interstellar gas that show some black areas if you have a little bit of imagination and you look it far from light pollution you will see as african tribes in botswana like the figure of a of a body of a female body the egyptians were considering it as nude Ah, okay. This is very interesting. And as as it yeah. goes from from east to west, you see, uh, the mouth is in the east. Uh, excuse me, the mouth is in the west to 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 eat the celestial bodies, and the uterus, the womb, is on the east to give birth to them. Okay, because here in 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 South America, here close to the equator. We have a place that is called the Chiribiquete, and they found some connection with the stars. It's very interesting, very uh, yes. It's a recent work, and they found um, the Orion constellation as a jaguar mm -hmm. that moved during the night, no? And also, they have the for them the Milky Way is uh, the anaconda, the, this big snake. So it's uh -huh, interesting uh -huh, now how, uh -huh. how they uh, they are uh, connecting their cosmogonies with the, the, the stars, no? the, the sky. Yes, yes. This is this is this is the beauty of ethnoastronomy. You find many ideas, sometimes different ideas, sometimes similar ideas to different cultures, different civilizations. And there is an, a, a cat constellation because I know that Egyptian Egyptians they have this connection with cats. I mean the ancient part, so there, there is a register of a cat constellation. I mean they, they put. Uh, to the the best of my knowledge, there is no there is no cat constellation. Okay, because I mean I I, I remember that uh, for them the cats are very important, no? So uh, maybe uh, yes, they had they yeah. had a cat go casted. Yeah. Yes. yes. So okay. Yes. Yes. So I but I, there is a, there is a constellation a deacon of two two tortoises. Ah, okay. The constellation of a bird. There is a constellation actually a deacon of the thousands thousands of troops. I mean um, sheep, for example. And this is Pleiades, the open cluster of Pleiades, M forty five ah. in the Messiah catalog. I would like to to thank Alicia, but before I, I would like to give all of the description of her CV, but I think it's very important because for, for the time we, we keep it. So the doctor... Uh, doctor thank you, thank you very much, uh, Camilo. Ja, just, just a small parenthesis. If, yeah. if, we had, if we had a little bit more time, I could show a video, 
uh, about the Dendera Zodiac. However, this is copyrighted and I don't know if this lecture will remain on the internet. Yes, it's going to be on the internet, so maybe... Yeah. So, so, so let's not, not, show no. the, not show the video. So, uh, okay, the doctor, Dr. Alicia Maravilla started her career with a bachelor in, in physics in the University of Thessaloniki with a diploma thesis in nuclear astrophysics, nucleosynthesis in stars. She obtained her first PhD degree in extragalactic astronomy at the University of Athens, studying the stellar complex of the Alien Sea and the Chaplin constellations through a star count and spectral classification of the stars on UTST plates in order to define the boundaries and measure as region of recent star formation. However, her love for ancient Egypt and the hieroglyphic script shifted her interest to Egyptology. She has obtained her second PhD degree. It's, my, it's the first time that I know someone that has two PhDs, so it's really impressive for me. And so she did her uh, second PhD degree from the University of Limoges in France in 2004, studying comparatively the astronomical ele elements of the ancient Egyptian funerary test, mainly pyramid tests, coffin tests, and partially book of the dead. With those of the ancient Hellenic Orphic hymns proposing a date for the late. She has managed to reconstruct ancient Egyptian scapes, interpreting the astronomical and cosmographic allegories of the ancient Egypt test through the archaeostronomical analysis of the contest. She has published more than 140 papers, books, and articles on several topics, including the astronomical orientation of the ancient Egypt Egyptian monuments, as well as the orientation of the mission tool stumps. After collaborating with CISRAS, she has founded in 2011 in Greece the Hellenic Institute of Egyptology, being its president, a research and educational institute initially under the species of the Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria and all Africa, whose scope is to raise funds for educational and research purposes. Currently, the institute runs in collaboration with national and international scholars, the following projects, Athens Moon Project, Digitation and Complete Study of the Ancient Egyptian Astronomical Test, um, the Egyptological Seminar of the Institute, teaching in the seminar and occasionally in the Center for Lifelong Learning of the Hellenic Open University, and the People's University of Athens. She's an executive editor in chief of the Journal of the Hellenic Institute of Egyptology, a member of the Scientific Committee of Peer Review Scholar Journal. Um, there, there are many of them. She's a member of the International Association of the Egyptologists, AU, Archaeological Society of Alexandria, ISAAC, SAF, Hellenic Society for Aesthetics Association of Greek women scientists and many others. So wow, it's really impressive CV. So it's a, for us in, in the junior members working group. It's a pleasure that, that you, you stay with us. Uh, thank you so much for for this talk. And thank you very much, uh, Camilo and Hannah. Thank you uh, all all of you. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope I was not too too archaeological or Egyptological, but you know, uh, it, it's it's a time you understand that you are both astronomer and, and Egyptologist, and you love both the same. So it's uh, it's a nice combination, I think. This is very important to do the things that you love. This is something that. And and uh, you know you know the uh, in the seminar in the institute seminar what I observe is that. Um, Mostly, uh, over 90% of people who come from positive sciences, they are better in uh, solving the exercises, grammar exercises of Middle Egyptian that I teach, much more easy for them than for, for archaeologists. Okay. Right. So, Hannah, do you want to yes. say something to finish? Um, yeah, no, just uh, thank you for the talk. Um, yeah. Um, 
it was very interesting. Um, it was nice to have you. Thank you. I think, uh, I think, yeah. Shall we wrap it up then? Yeah. So thank you mm -hmm. of all. Thank you very much. Time. I'm going to finish the, okay. the transmission. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.